Welcome. I'm Deborah Polsky. I'm the Executive Director of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. And we are so happy to have you here tonight as part of the Jim Schwartz Annual Lecture Series. And um, the historic, Dallas Jewish Historical Society has been around since 1971 telling the stories of Jewish Dallas. Whether you've been here only a few years, or your second or third or fourth generation, we want your stories and we like to tell your stories as much as we can. Um, just to tell you what's coming up, on Sunday the 26th we have a workshop about how to preserve what you have at home. You know, everybody's got that box of photos and <laughs> confirmation certificates yeah. and Sunday school report cards that your mother said, okay, you have to take this now. <laughs> um, and so Jessica, our archivist, Jessica Schneider, our archivist, um, is doing a workshop on Sunday. We try and do it a couple of times a year to help you um, with a starter kit figure out how to get started with that stuff, what you want to keep, what you don't, how to preserve it where to put it, and what you'd like to give to the Dallas Jewish Archive. And on the 28th, we have a new series with our corporate sponsor for this year, Dallas Jewish Funerals, and it is uh, the first program is Judaism and the Afterlife. And we will have um, Rabbi Adam Rothman and Rabbi Shelley Zimmerman and Tanner Don Kroll, who will be talking to us about what happens after you die. So I'm interested to hear what they have to say. But let me get back to our Jim Schwartz annual lecture series. Thanks to the generosity of a donor, we were able to rename our series in honor of Jim, a blessed memory, who was president of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society from 2012 to 2016. His community interests were many, but he will be remembered most for his work with the Dallas Jewish <coughs> Historical Society. A strong leader, Jim is remembered for the remarkable strides made at DJHS during his four-year tenure as president, maintaining strong fiscal responsibility offering meaningful and successful programs and fundraising events, and being instrumental in moving the organization forward in delivering full archival digitization, which is still in process, still a long process, but if you go to our website, djhs.org, you can see what's in the archive and you know put a name in or an organization that you're looking for and, and if it's part of the stuff we've already put in it'll show up and it'll tell you what we've got. We're very excited about that and that was really an impetus that, that Jim started. Best known for his warmth and his mental kite as well as his dedication to the growth of Dallas Jewish Historical Society, we're thrilled to have this opportunity to honor him with this annual series of lectures. So welcome. And our speaker tonight is Dr. Wendy Harpham. And her, uh, and we're going to have to introduce her, Susie Schwartz. Okay. Um, so I'm Susie Schwartz, and I'm honored to share brief remarks as means of introductions to Dr. Wendy Harbum, a woman of grace and wisdom who has certainly made history in Dallas and indeed throughout the nation. I have to not, I've known Wendy for so long, I'm finding I'm, I'm going to try very hard not to get choked up. Um, she's made history throughout the nation with her remarkable contributions, contributions that you'll learn are meaning, meaningfully informed by her deep Jewish values. Jim and I came to know Wendy, a doctor of internal medicine, her husband Ted, who is here, 
and their remarkable three children when our daughters became close friends in the third grade, a long time ago. <laughs> our family was honored to be part of the community of care when Wendy herself had an unfortunate cancer diagnosis, which meant she was traveling around the nation to clinical trials that would save her life, and we watched her strength as she sustained that activity. After many rounds of depleting treatments, Wendy did not have the stamina to, to, for the demands of her internal medicine practice, yet her drive to help and heal others, her very life force, was irrepressible and drove her to write books about cancer survivorship, covering subjects previously untouched, as she says, with a unique perspective from both sides of the stethoscope. Despite the sacrifices this work would require on her personal strength and her family time as she fought her own very difficult battle. Indeed, her works were so powerful that Wendy was invited to speak on talk shows across America, from Oprah to NBC Nightly News to Katie Couric three times to other iconic media properties. She's written eight books, including two children's books, and currently writes a regular column in Oncology Times. In fact, just this week, I think it was on the 20th, um, famous New York Times writer Jane Brody wrote an article, When Life Throws You Curveballs, Embrace the New Normal, largely based and <clears throat> quoting Wendy's writings in Oncology Times. Her work has received numerous, countless awards, only one of which is the Governor's Award for Health, which led, her to, which led to her induction in the Texas Women's Hall of Fame. Wendy's brilliant mind continues to uncover new ground. She is the pioneer on the subject of healing hope, a subject previously unstudied and of critical importance to patients, caregivers, clinicians, counselors, and more. Copies of her recent book, Healing Hope, which I read in its entirety last night, will be available. It's awesome. Very approachable, very easy to read, very insightful. Will be available for sale after this talk. With, pre, with the proceeds going to the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. Thank you for that, Wendy. She, she researches and co-teaches an honors class on this subject at UTD at Dallas today with her husband, Dr. Ted Harpham at UTD Dallas. <coughs> Wendy's prolific speaking and writing career is testimony to her desire to help others, and she is very comfortable in her role as teacher. Yet Wendy has never shared her personal story when speaking, but she has chosen to do so tonight in the hopes that it may be a source of help to others. Wendy Harpham, a friend to our family and to so many others in need, was an integral part of our team when my mother first faced the possibility of a life-threatening cancer many years ago, and again in 2017 when Jim was diagnosed. She has inspired our family and many others with her kindness and wisdom, and I feel certain that she will be inspirational to you as well tonight. Jim will be so proud of Wendy's relentless drive to help and of her continuous accomplishment and well-deserved recognition. With no further ado, I present Dr. Wendy Harper. Uh, it really is an honor, and you didn't cry, I hope I don't cry, but um, Jim was a mensch, and he was, I have nothing but beautiful memories of our time at volleyball and soccer and bat mitzvahs and pizza parties and sleepovers and ice cream on the front porch, uh, I could go on. Um, the other thing is that he really did live his life the best he could before and after his diagnosis. Um, I do remember when you called me to share about his diagnosis, and of course I was very happy to guide you to some doctors who might be able to help to talk about coping with a very frightening disease, and it was really hard that I didn't have what you really wanted, which was a magic wand. Um, but again, that's something we'll address tonight. But in honor of Jim, um, what I'll do is something I've never done before. I tell vignettes about my story all the time in my lectures to cancer survivors and caregivers and to when I do medical grand rounds, but it's always to the end of teaching a point, illustrating something, clarifying, reinforcing, or making fun of myself. Um, I've never told my story, and since the invitation, I've spent the past few weeks trying to put it together 
in a cohesive way that made sense and through the lens of my Judaism, which again I have talked about with close friends, but not publicly. Um, and so here goes, we'll see how, how, how this goes. First I'll just give, and for those of you who don't know me, just kind of a synopsis overview. Um, when I celebrated my 36th birthday, I was happily married, mm -hmm. and I had three healthy children you heard about, and they're darn cute, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and I had a thriving medical practice. And it was just a few weeks after my 36th birthday that I developed uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which was a type of cancer with no known cure. And over the next 17 years, I went through many courses of treatment um, because of side effects and after effects, I had to retire from clinical medicine. So I became a writer and I, and I became a public speaker. Um, those are the facts. But the question is, how did that happen? Meaning, how did I go from being a writer, uh, from being a physician, a clinician, to a writer? Um, you know, I went through 13 years of school to become a doctor. I was totally unprepared to become a professional writer. And the other thing, uh, to me, the more impressive thing is, how did I go from somebody who really was very nervous in front of an audience at a podium um, my comfort zone was one-on-one -on -one in the privacy of a medical office to doing public speaking, doing the major media and whatnot. Well, two prayers pl played a major role. Niebuhr's serenity prayer, which some people call the courage prayer, and Psalm 118 verse uh, 24. And this is a photo I took this morning of um, a wall hanging that I've had in my bedroom for decades. So. God grant me serenity, you know, to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And put another way, is like, it is what it is, what are you going to do about it? But the other one, the Psalm 118, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Um, that takes Niebuhr's prayer one step further and help define my path. And that is, what are you going to do to rejoice in it? My entire life, Judaism has compelled me to rejoice in life, to treasure my earthly existence. And that didn't change when cancer took away my well-being, my physical well-being, and took away the career, the, thing I, the only thing I'd ever wanted to be or do, which was to be a clinician. <clears throat> Um, and so, if anything, this psalm pushed me to figure out, okay, this is what it is. How am I going to enjoy this life for however long it is? And three Jewish values were the foundation. Learning, education. Um, so there's the practical aspect of obtaining knowledge to have some control over how you lived your life. Um, but there was also the intrinsic joy of learning. And then tikkun olam, doing good. And last, hatifa, hope. And I define hope as a feeling linked to a belief for in a better tomorrow. And it was these three legs that enabled me to move forward and live, not just live my life, not just survive, but to love my life, even though it was nothing but like the life I planned on and worked for. So here's the story. Uh, I was born in New York and raised on Long Island. Um, it was very easy to feel a strong Jewish identity in my childhood because um, in my home we observed the rituals welcoming every Sabbath with Shabbos candles, a beautiful Shabbos meal. Tzedakah was um, an important element in my home, you know, our little blue boxes. Um, and in my school, we often had uh, schools closed on the Jewish holidays because there was such a strong Jewish population and we belonged to the local conservative temple. Um, so again, it was very easy to feel strongly Jewish. Um, and learning was an important part of my upbringing in that both my parents were college and masters educated. Um, Education was highly valued, and medicine and law were 
it's in all the jokes, but they were considered very respectable and worthy uh, professions. Uh, I remember one of my very favorite bat mitzvah gifts was my Uncle Stanley gave me a, a huge Random House Unabridged Dictionary, uh, which lasted for decades until it just, poor thing, fell apart. Um, and even though there were all the jokes about my son the doctor, and now my daughter the doctor, um, and needless to say, they were very pleased when I chose medicine. I didn't go into medicine because of pressure from my parents. Um, I loved math and science, and my best friend in junior high, uh, we always had to have our sleepover dates at her house because her mother had a disease destroying rheumatoid arthritis. And it wasn't just that she was uh, crippled, she was in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sh students write this on their medical school applications, but it was true for me that it was a Sunday morning. The brother and the father were kind of arguing in the hallway about whether their doctor knew how much pain she was in, should they call. And I was sitting at the breakfast table looking at her medicine bottles lined up like soldiers on the table, and I just kind of said, I need to become a doctor. I need to become a doctor who understands what's going on at home and can communicate and so that my patients can communicate with me. So it wasn't just about the science, which I loved, um, of medicine, you know, connecting patients to the miracles of modern medicine. For me, it was about the communication piece. And um, I went to Cornell University knowing I wanted to be a physician. And uh, I, again, you know, all of us ask the question, what do I want to do with my life? And what do I want to do with today? And since the time I was 16 and knew I wanted to be a doctor, those questions were kind of easy for me. Everything was whatever I have to do to become a good doctor and be, learn all the skills I need to be a good communicator. Um, and so that was the big path, but it was also helped every day. And one memory I have is that um, I lived in a dorm at Cornell freshman year, and I liked to go to bed at 11 o'clock to get sleep so that I could be up for my classes and everything. And you know how dorms are, and they're partying. And I remember having to go out and I'd wait until 11, so I wasn't too much of a party pooper, but I asked them to please keep it down. And I think it was my drive to learn and my drive to become a physician that gave me the courage to be a nerd and tell him to shut up. Um, and an interesting PS to that story was 25 years later, through Facebook or something, I reconnected with one of the guys on my uh, people on my dorm, and I said, you know, I'm so sorry I used to make you, I asked you to be quiet after a little What are you talking about? We were so jealous of you because you knew what you wanted to do. <laughs> and that was just an eye-opener for me. So um, the other thing about Cornell uh, is that I took the unusual path of taking as few pre-med courses as I could and still apply, which is the opposite of what most people do. Uh, it did make my first year of medical school very hard, <laughs> but um, I took mythology and English literature, and I just, uh, in my house, the other thing I didn't mention that I meant to was growing up in my house, even though we had all the visual and the aesthetic thing, rituals of Judaism, my parents never once mentioned God, and they never once mentioned any relationship, personal relationship with God. So prayer was more about the melody and the song and the being together in the community, but there was nothing about the personal relationship with God. Uh, the other thing is that we never, and again, I, as an adult, I don't understand this, but we never talked politics. We never talked about it. So as a junior at college, I had to take intro to political theory. I said, I can't graduate college and not have some basis. And uh, TA was this tall, handsome fella. <laughs> His hair was to his shoulders. And, um, uh, he subbed my class. He wasn't my TA, but he subbed my class one week. And I was struggling because I think math and science was a different way of thinking. Anyway, we, we just kind of got into a conversation and we became friends. 
um, for the rest of the semester, we would meet, and he was interested in a lot of the ideas that I was interested in, we loved talking about the world, and I remember, um, and then that summer when I was done with the class, he kissed me, <laughs> and um, we fell in love, and uh, it's been an ongoing conversation and love affair ever since, two weeks ago we celebrated our 40th anniversary. Um, um, but I remember going to this really grungy bar called The Connection one night. I was drinking my root beer. He was drinking his real beer. And um, he said, so, what do you think about God? Like, do you think there's an afterlife? I was like, oh my God, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> and I really, I realized, I didn't know. I didn't know what I believed. But it was, and it was actually scary to think about it and talk about it. And what I said was, I'm becoming a doctor. If there's a, if there's a God, that'll, it'll, that'll be okay with God. He'll think that's good. So I felt like safe and I didn't have to deal with those questions. <laughs> I then went to the University of Rochester School of Medicine. Um, and um, what's interesting about that is the University of Rochester was ahead of its time as a yes. medical school in terms of, uh, this was 1976, introducing the biopsychosocial model of healing. <coughs> It is a very holistic approach. On my first day of medical school, the dean says, you know, we're not going to teach you how to treat congestive heart failure or cancer or kidney disease. We're going to teach you how to treat people with congestive heart failure and cancer. And from the first day to the day I graduated, everything about the curriculum and the rotations was geared toward understanding the patient experience and communicating effectively with patients. And George Engel was really um, a preeminent clinician in communication. And I got to do a rotation with him, which um, was very memorable and powerful in shaping my career. Uh, after I finished my third year of med school, um, Ted got a job, at his first job uh, after his PhD at University of Houston. So I ended up doing a visiting studentship in Houston, and uh, which again was a crazy experience because UH, UT Houston was transferring, uh, was transitioning from a three-year pre-med uh, medical school to four-year, and the year that I was the visiting student, there was no fourth year. I was in, which meant I was a sub-intern on all these rotations instead of learning from residents. I was rotating with the attendings, and they were treating me like a sub -in like an intern. It was the most incredible experience uh, for my preparation for becoming an intern the following year. Well, at the end of my internship year, uh, Ted got his position at UT Dallas. And I remember going to the chief of medicine and saying, I really like it here, but I'm moving to Dallas. <laughs> and um, Ed Goodman interviewed me for the program, and they were able to open a slot. And uh, I ended up really enjoying my residency and then opening a solo practice. The thing about my solo practice was uh, when I was thinking of what do I want to do when I finish residency, you know, you can do group, you can do solo. And I said, well, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm not doing solo because I didn't want anything to do with the business aspect of it. But I really wanted to do it my way. I really wanted to have that communication piece. <coughs> And I didn't want somebody telling me you need to, and I know I couldn't do it in 2020, but um, I didn't want somebody telling me, Wendy, you know, 20 minutes patient, blah, blah, blah. So I did go solo. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the stuff I did is probably not HIPAA. Again, this was 1983 <laughs> I opened, but would not be HIPAA approved today. But, you know, like we had a bulletin board where patients would send me pictures of their trips. And I had comic books in the reception room. I had education. I had a little room that I dedicated to educating my patients. So after your visit, you'd go in the education room with my medical assistant and understand what your diagnoses were. And you'd get handouts on what your medicines were and what, your, what I diagnosed. And um, I often crafted those uh, handouts to explain. So... <coughs> From doctor to patient. 
I told you that I was 36 years old, my kids were one, three, and five, and I was in my seventh year of medical practice when I developed lymphoma. And I put this up just to make the point that I've been through a lot of treatment and my perspective on illness and healing has been shaped by what I've been through. But it has also been shaped by the fact that I have received expert and compassionate care every step of the way. Really as close to ideal care as I can imagine. Um, and I remember going to one of my checkups um, with my oncologist and telling him, I was a princess with cancer. I mean, my life was magical, except for that cancer. Um, my, it's not, I mean, I, I could tell you so many things. Um, you know, my oncologist would swing by the chemo room to just check on me during my chemo. Uh, the nurses were always available to me. Uh, my husband put his career, he's a young professor, and he put his career on the slow track to take me to every chemo session. I remember waking up in the middle of the night in pain, and he would get up and he would be with me. Um, uh, at home, I have a photo montage of all the women who came. It was like Diamond's Red Tent. All these women came to take care of my kids when I couldn't. And, and Susie, in the weeks leading up to this, I've had this mental montage of all the people who came in to take care of me. Uh, Tuesday, he used to teach Tuesday nights, and three women alternated coming Tuesday nights. Um, the Jewish community congregation, well, again, I was the princess with cancer because of all these reasons. Um, but Congregation Beth Torah brought three meals a week, including a Shabbos meal, every single week. Um, the hospital organized uh, meals and, and helped. I knew that there were Mishabera everywhere for me. And I have to point out that my non-Jewish friends, um, some of whom were very devout, were essential players in supporting me. Uh, and interestingly, they always supported my Jewish faith, um, tried to understand, and um, I even got a Bible, a Christian Bible, that underlined all the commonalities for me, in case I couldn't find them, um, but made it easy for me to share the prayer, even though we came to it from very different places. Um, and uh, one of my Mormon friends took me around to find venues for the bat mitzvah because I was too sick to drive. So that was a couple years after. Uh, the other thing is that strangers have, the number of strangers who came into my life to help me deal with the challenges, and I'm not just talking the physical challenges, but the fear and the, um, the grief and um, just all of it. Um, I commuted to Stanford to participate in a phase one clinical trial. And when I, and so I, Ted went with me the first time when I had surgery, but I went by myself after that. And like, I get on super shuttle, and you know how it goes when you get on a bus, or it's like, oh, are you visiting, or you live here? You know, the usual conversation. I used to just cut to the kids, like, no, I'm here for a clinical trial. And the guy, he must have been in his early 80s, says, oh, that's terrible. And I'll take you to dinner. Well, <laughs> it turns out it was Ezra Solomon, who is a distinguished professor of finance at Stanford. And every time I went out for Stanford for one of my trips, which were about eight, he would take me out to dinner, either at his house. Um, and his wife had Alzheimer's, so uh, he didn't have a lot of social. And it's, we had this incredible friendship. And I do wonder what, sometimes what people were thinking in the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> this guy did. Um, but he, was, he was just so gracious and generous. And um, he was also on the editorial board of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and um, somewhere in the middle of that, we got a knock on the door that we had a package. <laughs> we had a complete Britannica. Um, and the other thing is, Ted would give me $15 each time I went by myself, so that instead of looking forward to the treatment, I could look forward to going to the gift shop and buying so something for getting through this treatment. And, you know, the one of the women who worked at the cashier would say, recognize me after a couple of visits, and 
chatted me up. He said, well, how are you getting to the airport? I said, well, I'm taking a super show. No, you're not. And after that, and it must have been my second visit, she drove me every time to and from the airport. Um, I just connected with her by wonderful internet. And, uh, so anyway, I mean, these people were angels. And I bring up the idea of the core hula, um, holy. Uh, you know, since I was a child, I always appreciated this value of visiting the ill, um, doing what you can to help someone who is down in some way. We know things in different ways. And being on, and I expected to devote my life to the holy, taking care of other people. Being on the other side, Seeing how it changed my life, how much it meant, um, just was one of the key motivating factors that pushed me to try to do the work I do. Um, I, I mentioned being the princess of cancer, um, and the point is that even though I knew all that, it was still really hard. And all this journey of my life, I have always had this sense of, it's been hard for me and I have every advantage. What about these people who don't have a TED, or have a special needs child, or are dealing with a special needs parent? Um, what about people, I never worried about if I'd be able to pay for my treatment. I did for sure worry if they would have a treatment for me, but I, I couldn't, I know I can't even imagine what it's like to not only worry about if there's a treatment, but will I be able to pay for it if there is a treatment. So um, that has been a big part of my perception of the world. Rabbi Lehner likes to say that Wendy wasn't only on a medical journey, she was on a spiritual journey. And it really is true. Uh, Rabbi Lehner was new to Congregation Beth Torah, who was young, and I think I was his first case. Um, so the week I was like, oh actually, I hadn't thought about this until just now, but uh, when I was diagnosed I was in the hospital <coughs> and I'd never really talked to him one-on-one. -on -one. I'd seen him up on the pulpit, but I'd never talked to him. And uh, I'd, I was in the hospital, I just found out I had cancer, and in he walks and my first thought is, ah, he's come to give me last rites. <laughs> um, but he did come to my home starting that first week when the world, when it was very disorienting. And I remember him saying, well, people find out who they are in the tough times, not the easy times. Uh, we prayed together, we studied together, he counseled me. Um, he had this habit, as rabbis do, of answering my questions with questions. And we did talk about, is there a God, and what happens after, and um, obviously, unlike when we were at the Guanji Bar, these were no longer armchair philosophical discussions that I could put aside. Um, facing this diagnosis, I had to know whether I believed in a God or not. And I needed to know if I believed there was life after death. And um, the other thing that I really struggled with at the beginning is, what about my kids? I mean, what about my kids? It was really hard. Um, so the first two or three sessions, we talked a lot about, what if I die? And I remember in the middle of the next session, I'm kind of going, oh, what if I live? You know, what am I supposed to do? Well, what now? Um, and that was the first question that he did not answer with a question. He answered definitively, with what I consider rabbinic ambiguity, do the right thing. And at the time, I'm thinking, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> you know. And in the 20 years <coughs> since he said it to me, it has been the best piece of advice. Mm -hmm. um, just do the right thing. And it was during that first year that I really discovered that I believed in God, and that I discovered what prayer, not melody, but what prayer is. Um, I did have a couple of intense spiritual experiences. I'll just touch on briefly. 
the first time I had radiation, the, when I had radiation therapy, um, it was up my head and neck, and so what they do is they put you on the gurney and they make a plastic mold to, and literally clamp it down <coughs> to the table so that you can't move a millimeter. Um, and then, of course, because of the radiation, nobody can be in the room when they slam that big lid or whatever it is, door, and then the light goes on of the machine and a little bit of a buzz, and I was scared. Um, and I just started chanting the Shema in my head. It was a reflexive thing. And the surprise was not that that prayer came to me, but that I felt heard. And that in the most isolating place, I did not feel alone. And uh, a couple weeks after that, sometimes I couldn't sleep, so I'd go into the living room, and we have a clock in the kitchen, which in the quiet of the night, I heard tick, tick, tick. And it's like, wow, I know it didn't start ticking. <laughs> I just never heard it before, except in the quiet of the night. And that's analogous to my experience of God in that facing my mortality, um, feeling the world so differently because of being ill and not knowing if I had a future, um, and being alone in that radiation suite, I felt something I'd never felt before, and I've been able to feel it ever since. Um, well, there was the other journey from doctor to writer. Uh, I told you I wasn't a writer. Uh, in fact, when I get together with some writer friends I've had since becoming a writer, our backgrounds couldn't be more opposite. All of them, except me, were voracious readers and diar diarists and always writing. Not me. I didn't. The only thing I wrote was my progress notes in the patient's charts, I truly tried to, it's the uh, history, the physical, the assessment, which is your pulling together how, what you think is going on, and your plan. And I truly tried to craft that assessment of plan. I joked. I said, you know what? If I get struck by lightning, any doctor will be able to step in and take care of my patients, because I made that assessment of plan as clear as possible. And I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed the writing. And the only other thing is I did sometimes um, write letters and people would tell me that my letters were whatever. Um, but I wasn't a writer. And uh, although, again, I did mention that I wrote those patient handouts in, the, in my uh, office. One experience before my diagnosis, I remember driving home on Central Expressway after caring for a young dad who had a blood disorder that was causing um, blood, life threatening blood clots. And, you know, I was very professional taking care of him, but driving home, I kind of let down my guard and I really felt for him. And I felt how sad it was that that family was being so changed by his disease. Um, and what was interesting about it was, I remember, I don't know if I said it out loud or I just said it in my head, but I said, you know, there for the grace of God go I. My white coat does not protect me in some magical way. And the other thing is, after my diagnosis, a couple of people said, you know, it's not fair. And it's like, you only have to be a doctor for a week to know that life is not fair. So that was never an issue for me. And yet, so between, until the time of my diagnosis, I really worked hard to learn as much as I could about the patient experience because it was only through that understanding that I would be able to reach across um, most effectively. So I read books by patients with spinal injuries and brain tumors and breast cancer and all this stuff. And the first night home, lying in bed, the first night after my diagnosis, lying in bed, and I was in a lot of pain because I had a compression, a compressed nerve, um, and I was terrified, of course. And it was quiet because Ted was asleep. My three kids were asleep. And I'm saying, I didn't have a clue. 
much as I tried to understand, I didn't have a clue. And I said, I need to remember this. Because I just knew that I would adjust to my diagnosis and get in a groove. So I said, I want to capture it now. And I tiptoed into the kitchen, two in the morning, and I tried to write down, what is it like for a doctor to become a patient? And over the next six weeks, I worked and worked and worked on that. And part of the reason was, um, 1990 was before they had anti-nausea medicine, and writing helped distract me from the nausea, trying to find, because I was trying to find words that not only as accurately as possible could vicari using words to vicariously let somebody who hasn't experienced something understand what I was experiencing, but I also wanted it to be beautiful. I wanted it to flow like melody. I mean, have you ever read something where you're so engaged in it that you forget about the world? People call it flow, and somebody will call your name and you go, oh, you know, you didn't even realize you were in it. That's what I was striving for, and it took all my energy. Um, it distracted me from my pain, and from my nausea, and I was also on high-dose steroids, so I was, like, wired. Um, and at the end of it, I shared it with some colleagues who told me they found it useful. So writing became a way to escape my crisis and add meaning to it. Well, I'm going, I've got four more months of chemo. I'm learning so much, I'm going to write a pamphlet that I'm going to leave in my reception room. Well, fast forward 200 pages of my pamphlet, <laughs> and Ted comes in and says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm writing a pamphlet. He says, well, you're writing a book. And I said, I'm not a writer. It's a pamphlet. <laughs> and he calls up, he writes textbooks, so he called up his editor, who said, you know, it's a book. Have her send it to me. So um, he is the experienced marker. And he explains to me, maybe it's going to be very hard. You're going to wait a long time to hear back. And, you know, you may be knocking on doors for nine months. So I said, okay. And we packed it up on June 16th. And on June 18th, he called to see if my package arrived. And the editor tells him, yeah, it arrived. I really liked it. Uh, we have a contract. So that was my first book. <laughs> um, um, and one point about it is, I, I mentioned angels before helping with the children and helping me through the emotionality, the losses of my illness. I've had angels with my writing that I cannot explain. I mean, I've had, the, my oncologist read, like he's not busy enough, he read the early manuscripts, which was really key to me holding on to my sense of self when I couldn't do patient care. Um, I met Dr. Morgan Stone, who was head of oncology at Baylor. He didn't know me from Adam, and I just told him I'd written this thing, I'd really like you to read it and maybe write a blurb, and he goes, sure. And he's read almost everything I've written since in terms of giving me feedback. Doctors, who I know were really busy, not just the first book, but the books have followed, I don't know when they did it, but they supported my writing. They gave me honest feedback, and they helped me um, write. Um, and then the other thing is I had, Susie mentioned my column in Oncology Times. In 2005, my call partner um, died of lymphoma. And he'd been my mentor uh, and friend and my husband's physician. And uh, it was a hard loss. So I wrote this essay called Patent Pending, The Measure of the Life. And I sent it to Oncology Times because they reviewed all my books, the books I've done so far, and said, hey, what do you think of publishing this piece? It's just kind of a feeling piece. And she says, emails me back and says, oh yeah, we'd, we'd love to publish this, and we'd like to give you your own banner, which means my own column. Mm -hmm. I was like, ah, uh -uh, no, 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 I can't do that. Um, I never know if I'm going to be well, and I can't have deadlines, and I need to rest in the afternoon. Nope, can't have any, can't do it. She says, oh, no, 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 no deadlines. We publish 24 times a year. If you want to send two columns a year, fine. If you want to send 24 columns a year, fine. <laughs> Whatever you want to send. Uh, I have uh, just started my 198th column <laughs> for Oncology Times. Uh, so, again, when writers hear this story, you know, 
what kind of a gig is that? <laughs> no, no deadlines? Um, I don't get it. I don't get it, but I'm doing it. Um, the other thing about my illness is it wasn't a one-time thing. You know, there, with, when you go through cancer, you can kind of deal with some of it, but if you can get back to your life, you can avoid dealing with some of the other stuff. That was never an option for me because I really never got well again. Um, and I mentioned my three legs and one was learning. I, are there any psychiatrists in the room? I'm sure there's some term for this, but you know, I remember when I was diagnosed with my first recurrence, of course I was devastated, but I also said, oh, now I can learn about recurrence and write about it. You know, I have radiation. Oh, now I can write about radiation. I had this or that. I could think, I'll learn about it. I'll write about it. You know, and there was a sense of using it. So, learning, and I did learn about it in a different way, experiencing it, and to Kunalam using it to help other people. Um, and the third was the hope, but it was always tied into this idea of using my voice to narrow the gap between what we know of ideal care and the care that patients receive. Um, I have a list of all the angels, you know, if I, I'm looking at my watch, if I told you all the angels, we would be here until Monday. Uh, <laughs> And that would be with me talking as fast as New Yorkers talk. Um, but I have to tell you about Jane Brody. When I wrote my second book, uh, the publisher pitched it to Jane Brody, who invited me to her house uh, to do the interview. Well, you all know Jane Brody is a foodie, meaning she's written two cookbooks, and she's just a master cook. Well, 10 days before my interview, I'd had my bone marrow harvested, and I was not eating, meaning I was having trouble eating. And she was so thoughtful and caring. Um, she was trying to get me a little bowl of strawberries that I might be able to eat. And all my friends are going like, you had lunch at Jane Brody's and you ate a bowl of strawberries? <laughs> you know, missed out on your opportunity. I've always thought of the healing circle. and This is where I wanted to be. My white coat, my stethoscope, one-on-one, -on -one, privacy of the office, taking care of patients. But my cancer made that impossible. And it put me on in knee-deep in all the other sides, uh, all the other arcs of the healing circle to learn about them. Um, and I found myself as a writer and then a speaker in an interesting position of being able to advocate for doctors and nurses to patients and advocate for patients to doctors. You know, when I stand up at Grand Rounds um, and I talk about the difficulty of fatigue, if a buyer from Nemo Marcus did the exact same delivery, with the exact same words and gestures, it wouldn't mean quite the same as hearing it from a physician with a shared background who um, understands the medicine of it. So I've really worked hard to use my voice to advocate for patients to clinicians, and to advocate for clinicians to patients. Surprisingly, you know, I started this 27, I started writing 27 years ago. Surprisingly, and very sadly, I feel the need more than ever, because of the changes in medicine, to do the bilateral advocacy. And surprisingly and sadly, I feel the need more than ever to advocate for science. Um, so I'm still writing. Um, I have to mention one angel in my life. Her name is Susan Shapiro. Uh, in 2003, um, there was an event at Presbyterian Hospital for the third edition of my first book. And a friend of mine brought another person, Susan Shapiro. And, and again, I'm just sharing an angel story. And so she came up after the thing, she introduced herself, said she enjoyed it, and she said, you know, I'm a freelance writer, and if you ever needed somebody to just look at your stuff, I wouldn't charge you. Um, I'd be happy to do that. And I was polite, and I said, thank you very much. And inside my head, I'm going, I'm not going to ask you to read my stuff. Um, and uh, over the next couple of weeks, she kept emailing me 
um, and asking if she could drop by to get a signature on the book because somebody had been diagnosed with cancer, she wanted to get them a copy of the book. And you know how it goes. You kibitz on the front porch, and then you kibitz in the front hall, and then you kibitz in the kitchen. And we got to know each other. And one fateful day, I said, uh, I just was excited about the, the article I was writing, so I said, hey, listen, do you want to you see what I'm working on? And she said, sure. Um, and she emails me comments that were unlike comments I've gotten from anybody else. This is a woman who loves language, loves words, and is really good at it. And that was 2003, and in the how many years, I can't add, years since, 17. huh, 17? We have, first of all, we've become just soulmate friends. But we have shared this love of language. Um, she's read everything I've written, including pitch letters. And we argue about if it should be a, or the, or past tense, or past participle. We argue about the adjective, or the gerund, or whatever it is. And uh, it, out of, maybe I'm taking and making up a number, out of, let's say she's done 100,000 uh, criticisms, I've taken all but three. Um, <laughs> She's almost always right. Even if I say it first, no, no, I don't think you're right. And then I'll go hang up and I'll think about it. <laughs> I'll go, yeah, she's right. <laughs> so the reason I mention her is I couldn't be the writer I am if it weren't for people like her or my editors. Again, I learned, I learned in the school. I mean, my first book, my first editor was the vice president of Norton. My second editor was the vice president of Harper Collins. How does that happen? I don't know. But, um, People have just really supported my work. Oops, what did I do? So the three, these three things from um, doctor to patient, from doctor to writer, uh, all three legs have gone on the entire time. This is not going to be a lecture on survivorship, um, but I just want to, to mention that um, in 1992, I introduced the term healthy survivorship for a survivor who gets good care and lives as fully as possible. And I introduced a basic three-step approach to getting good care and living as fully as possible, the centerpiece of which is hope. And not just any hope, but what I call healing hope, namely hope that helps patients get good care. Hope that helps patients live as fully as possible. Hope is a word we all use every day, and I appreciated its importance as a physician before my diagnosis. I knew I needed hope as a patient. I wrote about hope from the first piece I ever wrote, but it was only about 10 years ago um, that I started exploring hope. Instead of just using the word and talking about it, I said, well, I want to figure out what hope is and how hope works. And what role do patients play in finding hopes that help, what I call healing hopes? What role do clinicians play in finding hopes that help you get good care and live as fully as possible? And the more I learned, the more I realized how complex and controversial and, and um, difficult it is. As an aside, I couldn't do any of what I'm doing without the professor of political theory over there. Um, who, ha when he reads a manuscript of mine, he'll say, well, do you know what that means? <laughs> you know, I'll reference an idea, sort of Damocles or something. Well, do you know what the sort of Damocles is? Well, no. And then he'd get down his textbook and he'd show me. And um, he always, he's the big ideas kind of guy, and I'm the very detailed woman. And between he, he calls me on everything, and he pushes me, and he doesn't accept it when I'm not clear. So again, I couldn't do anything that I've done without his support. And the only things I'll share with you about hope are that, uh, kind of the conclusion of the past 10 years and what I've tried to communicate to patients and clinicians is that, and you can see the underpinnings of Judaism here in terms of choosing life. Um, there is always, and that life is good, there is always something good to hope for. And you can choose to set the stage for hope. I didn't say you can choose hope. Hope is a feeling, it's 
transitory, a lot of factors, some of which are beyond our control, determine what we feel. You know, I can't, but I can choose to set the stage for feelings of hope to emerge. The other thing is that nobody can give you hope. Hope is like faith, um, it's from within. Um, and this idea that it's not something that just arises spontaneously or happens. If you want to find healing hope, it takes time, it takes work, it takes effort, it takes learning. The past, since the invitation to do this has been a journey for me, thinking about my survivorship through the lens of Judaism and trying to pull it all together. And, um, you know, when I read Job with Rabbi Lehner, the message of Job for me was, one, you know, in the world, then, how are you even asking this? You, you can't know this. And while there are people who, it's not just a, it, it is a semantic thing. People will say, well, I know what happens. I know there's a God, or I know what happens after death. It's like they believe, and so I've come to my beliefs. But I can't know. I can't know. And I don't try to know. I don't need to know. I don't try to know. What I know is what I can do on earth. Um, and in terms of my survival, at some point, researchers are going to be able to figure out why Wendy Schlesel Harpum was the patient on the far right of the survival curve. They'll figure out something about whether it's some 1418 translocation that had a little arm on it, or that I ch chopped the carnation in some breakfast in the morning, or who, the freckle on my left elbow, I don't know what it is. But there'll be a scientific explanation for it. But medicine will never be able to explain why I had the team of doctors, you know, why I was in Dallas and I had the team of doctors I had. Why? I had that second recurrence, the week, the trial, had a place for one more patient. That I didn't have the recurrence a month earlier when I would have gotten an insignificant dose, or a week after my recurrence when I wouldn't have been eligible for the trial and I would have had a bone marrow transplant and my life would have been very different. Here is what I do know. You all know the joke about the very devout person who is walking alone and slips off the cliff and is holding on and says, God will save me, God will save me, God will save me. And then a troop of Eagle Scouts comes by and throws a rope. He says, no, 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 God will save me. And then a helicopter comes and drops a rope into that basket. No, no, God will save me. When he dies, it's like, I've been devout. I believe in you. Why didn't you save me? I sent a troop of Eagle Scouts. I sent a helicopter. <laughs> well, that is not my case. I have experience God's angels in my life, only a handful of which I've talked about to you. Um, you need to understand, it always makes me a little uncomfortable when people talk about my accomplishments, because I honestly feel like Ted and Susan and some other people should be on my bylines of my books. I honestly feel like Gail and Kathy and all these other people should be in the same sentence when they talk about my strength dealing with my challenges. I didn't do it myself. I had all these people there lifting me up, supporting me, helping me. So I'm going to conclude by reading um, a couple paragraphs that I wrote for an essay for the Templeton Foundation. Uh, they, it was 20 years ago, and they asked for essays on the power of purpose. And this is what I wrote. Um, <clears throat> each of us develops beliefs as we go through life. During my illness, mystical experiences not discussed here touched my soul and nourished my trust in something beyond my farthest stretched imagination. Like Job, I don't know. I have faith. And this is why, it, this explains why it doesn't frighten or upset me to know, to know with my heart as well as my intellect, that my life is barely a blink in time. I have no doubt that 100 years from now, 
let alone a thousand years from now, not a single person will remember my laugh or know the touch of my hand. I expect not a single word of mine to remain in print or online. <laughs> the only remembrance of me will be a faint echo, a totally unidentifiable ripple effect of my words and actions. This hyper-awareness of my own insignificance has had the paradoxical effect of energizing me with the power of participating in tikkun alone, repair of the world. If you and I, in our short lifetimes, highlight our similarities, not our differences, and if we love the other <coughs> as thyself, our words and actions can be like water droplets dripping over granite. Imperceptibly through the generations, we can reshape our world into one of love and peace. I used to watch the news reports and see a world broken in so many places. It seemed overwhelming, <coughs> hopeless. Then I experienced the kindness and caring of hundreds of people who helped me through my illness. And I knew there is hope one drop at a time. I'm happy to Any take questions? questions and I'll stay after um, for if anybody has something one on one. I always felt and knew that the energy was coming from you and you were driving other people to help you and you were amazing for that as long as I've known you. It's, it's you that's doing it and the strength and how you, how you treat people, how you get along with people. And I was always amazed and even envious of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A question. You talk about these angels who come to help. How do you approach people when they're going through something like this and not feel that you're intruding? It's a very practical question. And actually, uh, Susie mentioned this Tuesday's Science Times article by Jane Brody. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the week before, last week, she wrote an article, What to Say to Someone with Cancer. Um, there are guidelines and principles to follow. And uh, I made the mistake, or not the mistake, of reading all the comments, the hundreds of comments to her <laughs> column. And some people can be very harsh. Um, and like some, I gave some advice in the column. And one was, don't say, how are you? Say, how are things? Because as a patient, I really, I came, for a while, I came to hate when people asked, how are you? for 20 different reasons, and if you email me, I'll send you the article. Um, but uh, the underlying principle is to show you care in a way, and to let them know what you're available to do to help, to before Colleen. Um, but to do it in a way that you leave the power in their hands, and that you are not burdening them, you know. Um, uh, again, this article covered so many things, like one person said, just come and, just go in there and clean up their house and change, you know, rearrange their soft doors and bring them meals, and it's like, that is very disempowering. I mean, it's done with uh, good intent, but it's very disempowering. So I think if you just step back and say, my goals are to show I care and to let the person know what I can offer, in a way that is not a burden and that allows the person to maintain control, then I will have succeeded. Um, I found that sending notes was the best way because, or emails, I hated the phone because even though, again, they were trying to show they care, that put me on their time and it's the sort of thing, if I was resting I was interrupted, if I was having a moment when I wasn't thinking about having cancer, it put me right back into the fact that I was a patient. Um, 
Whereas if people, well now we have email, you know, email, if the person reads it, they're reading it when they can, when they're in a frame of mind, and they can do it. And they can do as little as they want. And I also, when I reach out to people, I always make a point of saying, I only want to help. Feel free to tell me to shut up or to, you know, back off or whatever. Um, and I, I do that repeatedly, uh, especially because people do turn for me for advice. That I, I think just as you can never say too many times to somebody, I love you, I think you can never say too many times, oh, although my sister, when I was helping her through her illness, she said, you don't have to say it, to say it again. I know you only want to help and you're not going to tell me what to do. You're only helping me figure out what I want to do, um, which is great. But generally, uh, you can't say too often, I only want to help. Please feel free to tell me if something I'm doing is not helpful. These are the things I can do for you right now. Um, are any of these, do any of these sound good for you? You know, be it run errands, do, do laundry, bring a meal, uh, drive you to a doctor appointment, go to be a second pair of ears for a doctor visit, um, babysit, do you have a, a parent you're responsible for? Can I, uh, you know, check on your parent? List practical things. Um, and again, I keep coming back to that, how are you? Because to me that's... Um, illustrative of the difference between you being in control and the other person being in control. Um, and it's not just, how are you, it's, how are you? <laughs> and it's like, I'm fine. Really? It's like, <laughs> really? <laughs> um, but just, how are things? And then if they want to talk about what's doing with their treatments or their health, you're all ears. Um, and if they want to talk about anything with that, you're all ears. Uh, I'm going to wrap that one up with the idea of be there. Sometimes people are so scared of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing that they find it easier to withdraw. It's better to mess up and be there. Yeah. Wendy, you had all these angels. You're an angel to me. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, these experiences that we have, we have um, give us opportunity to make life better for someone else. And right. you've, you've made that choice, which it is a choice, and I'm forever grateful for that. There's an image. Uh, the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship was established in 1986. It is the first and only organization by cancer survivors for cancer survivors. And they're the organization that coined the term survivor. So when I went to my first meeting in 1992, they shared this image that's um, like this, that you reach up for help, you're the survivor, you reach up for help when you're needing it, and you reach back to pull up the other person. Um, and intertwined with every experience I've had was always this sense of, I'll learn something That'll make it easier for somebody else. Again, that princess with cancer thing, I can't get it out of my head. Um, I'm trying somehow to level the field a little bit. Well, you know, I think the average person, I definitely had an advantage as a doctor in 1990 with my diagnosis. But I, and again, this was before <coughs> the internet and before yellow bracelets and before the explosion of information. And I thought the average person can learn enough to get the kind of care that I was getting. And I wanted them to have that. Uh, I, just, I just feel like there's so much to learn and there's so much we can do. As a doctor, but then also as being a patient, what would you say your best way to be your own advocate is? Uh, to obtain sound knowledge, to work on the relationship. Uh, actually, that happiness in the storm is, was my attempt to grapple with how does somebody get the best care they can in the messy world of medicine. Um, it's obtaining sound knowledge, it's finding and nourishing realistic hope, healing hope, 
and then taking effective action. It means knowing that medicine is messy and imperfect, knowing that there's a difference between the science of medicine and the art of medicine. You know, a physician can be absolutely expert, but be not a very good artist in terms of communicating or relating. And you're looking for something different in a surgeon than in your primary care doctor. Um, I've always been reality-based. I've never been like a dreamer wanting things perfect. I've always wanted, I want to understand the way things are so that we can make it the best we can with what we have. Um, and that, that's the short answer. But you have the benefit of a lot of resources to help you obtain sound knowledge and find a nurse hope and take effective action. Work. I noticed on one of your slides under, I think it was, it said spiritual mere woods. Well, I was looking at my watch and I said, I can't tell you, we're sorry. Um, when, when I entered the clinical trial, I was 38 years old. Our children were three, five, and seven. And the average life expectancy for patients like me was about two years. And I knew that. So my expectation, and I have some people in this room here who remember when that was the ex expectation was that I was not going to see my kids graduate elementary school. Um, so after a struggle of choosing which treatment, I elected to be in this phase one trial. And it was at Stanford. So between the day that I had all the pre-op, you know, pre-treatment work, <coughs> scans and everything, and then the day I went in the hospital for the treatment, we went to Mirror Woods. Have, have anybody been yeah, on there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we're at the top, and where it's silent. And we didn't see anybody, and we just sat down. Very intimate moment, my husband and myself, not knowing what lay ahead, and praying for watching over me, praying that this treatment might work. So I never knew if it was the monoclonal antibodies or your woods. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, I think you should end this with telling everybody how many grandchildren you have. Now. Oh, and I just <laughs> right. Um, you know, I, I talk a lot about hopes and having hopes and prioritizing your hopes. And when I went to Muir Woods, one of my biggest hopes was, I mean, it was hard to hope for, but I really hoped to see my oldest become a mom. Yeah, I remember you that said was that was just the first thing you said. Can, can, I, can I just see that? Mm -hmm. um, and grandchildren were oh, just yeah. not on the radar. They were just, I and mean, that seemed so fantastical that they were just not on the radar. And um, as of October 2nd, I have five grandchildren under, <laughs> under four. <laughs> and they all live within two miles of me. Uh, uh, so, I know, no, I know. Fair. And again, I, I don't know why I've been so blessed. I don't know. And, and every day I think about even you know, Diana, mm -hmm. it would have been enough. I mean, if I just had this marriage and nothing else in my earthly life, it would have been enough. And if I'd gotten to see that first bat mitzvah, it would have been enough. I, I think one of the hardest things I struggle with is, not struggle with, but um, deal with, manage. I've made a lot of friends along my journey, and I've lost a lot of friends. A year and a half ago, I lost my sister. It's a mystery. And the only way I can respond to this mystery is to work even harder. You know, I, um, when I finished my last book, my, all three of my kids said, 
Huh? You've done enough. Now relax. Just relax. And, and just enjoy being a grandmother. It's like, I can't. I can't. Uh, the story when I was doing one of my books, Ted's mom rescued my family. Uh, his parents, again, were angels. Uh, they literally moved into the house for a month at a time, took care of the kids. Um, and at one point I like rushed up to try to work on a manuscript and his mom just didn't understand. She was like, first of all, she didn't think I was going to make it. And she was like, can't, can't you just watch TV? Can't you just relax and enjoy? Because to her that was, if, if you're facing a shortened life, just relax and just just enjoy. Let people take care of you. Just just relax. Eat ice cream. And she had a hard time understanding that I needed to do this work. I needed to find a phrase. I needed to to take care of this. Um, I also I joked a lot about um, God thinks I'm stupid because I got cancer and went through a lot, and then I went back to my practice. It's like, she tried to practice. <laughs> Got a recurrence. So I worked in another doctor's office, and my cancer came, and it's like, she's working in another doctor's office. <laughs> you know, Got cancer again. Okay, I'll stop practicing. <laughs> um, and again, this gift, who knew I could write? Um, but I can. And um, Adam Smith has this thing where he says, you know you're you when somebody tells you you're you. And I wouldn't come out here and say, I'm a great writer, guys. But I've had vice presidents of major publishing houses tell me, you're a really good writer, Wendy. And so it's like, okay, I gotta use it. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't understand where it came from. And I, again, I'm, I'm feeling very vulnerable standing up here telling you this, but there are so many times that I'm writing and this this wonderful phrase will come to my head. It's like, thanks. It's like, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know where it comes from. Uh, I have a pad by my bed at night. He'll tell you. He'll, hey, you know what? He, he's, he can testify <laughs> what, what's honest up here, what's not. What are you going to say? No one does that one. But I do have all this. And, and the, the last thing I'll close on is um, I, I told you. I don't understand why I've been so blessed. And it was devastating to close my practice. I had cried every day for a year. Uh, in fact, we were, a group of women came to my house and we were stuffing dear patient letters uh, saying, Dr. Harbin has cancer, she's closing the practice for 10 months, um, you need to get your care elsewhere. And my five-year-old daughter was there helping us helping us, and uh, somebody started telling a story about Wendy being a doctor, and she says, well, my mom, he used to be a doctor. She's not a doctor. And, you know, we were all trying to giggle and make light of a very terrible week. I was like, <laughs> silence, out of the mouths of days. Um, but I love being a writer. I, I discovered a passion I love it differently than medicine, um, but I just love the craft of writing. Um, anyway, there you go. Thank you so much. Um, it was enchanting. Um, I hope that you will join us again for one of our other uh, programs in our lecture series and for some other events that we have. And um, thank you so much for coming tonight. And uh, books are for sale if you want to buy them.